Order, order. Welcome to this afternoon's special session of the Department of Business Trade Select Committee where we're scrutinising arms exports and Israel. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome colleagues from the International Development Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee to join us today. Now, Ministers, I know that you will need no reminding of this, uh, but for the record, you will be aware of the resolution of the House of the 12th of August 1947 which says that the refusal of a witness before a select committee to answer any question which may be put to them as a contempt of the House and the fraction of the undoubted right of this House to conduct any inquiry which may be necessary in the public interest. I know you will also have tattooed on your minds the Ministerial Code, paragraph 1.3b. Ministers have a duty to Parliament to account and be held to account for the policies, decisions and actions of their departments and agencies. And Ministers should be open as possible with Parliament and the public refusing to provide information only when disclosure would not be in the public interest. And you will know, too, the court decision uh, in the High Court on the 10th of July 2017, which reads, there is an expectation consistent with democratic values that a person charged with making assessments of this kind, such as decisions on arms export licences, shall be politically responsible for them. So the political accountability in this session is important in the legality of decisions you take. With those introductory words complete, Chris Law is going to open the questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a question for yourself, Minister Mack. Um, what is the current value of UK defence and security exports to Israel? Well, well th thank you, Mr Law, and uh, thank you, Chairman, to you and your colleagues for convening this session. Both the Deputy Foreign Secretary and I are pleased to be with you today. Apologies that we weren't able to align our diaries for the first offer date, I think, after another exchange we were able to agree on today's date so thank you to you and your colleagues for your time we're also joined by kate joseph who oversees the work of the export control joint unit who will be here for some technical uh, support as well so thank you mr law you asked about the value of um licenses to israel um so the last year that we have full published data for is 2022 um we granted licenses for defense exports worth 42 million pounds in relation to Israel uh, and for wider context that represents 0.15 percent of you of the UK's total defense exports licenses and less than one percent of Israel's defense imports so um, 42 million is the figure for 2022 um, by way of sort of wider context, our total exports to Israel on all categories that year was 3.6 billion. So that just gives you a sense of the relatively low, low scale, low proportion of the total. Um, I can also help you by just providing some slightly more up to date figures as well. Can we hear them, please? Can you we hear can, more up to date? I can. So for the 12 months to the end of quarter two, 2023, so i.e., to the end of June. 2023, um, 107 defence export licences to Israel were issued, and they were valued at £41 million. So you can see that there is a relatively stable trend or relatively low defence exports to, to Israel. Uh, indeed, since 2008, when this sort of record keeping began, £41 million per year is around the, the ballpark average. Um, and I'd also just mention, just for completeness, that whilst we issue licenses for certain values, um, they may not necessarily be taken up because the export may never take place or only take place partially. So I hope that gives you some context, give you a sense of the, the, the sort of numbers we're dealing with. Do you have any figures, uh, particularly since October 2023, and can you tell me any licenses are there and how many have been granted since that time? And what's the total value, please? That was since October 2023, 20, since the conflict began. Is that what you're, 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 you're getting at? Um, so let me give you, give you some, some wider context to this, and then hopefully I, I may be in a position to help the, the, the committee. Um, so on the 13th of June this year, you will know that we are due to publish our next set of quarterly statistics covering the period 1st of July to the 31st of December 2023. So in other words, filling in the last two quarters of 2023, where we haven't... I think the concern, Mr Mack, is that we're late on the quarterly stats. They're not six-monthly stats, they're quarterly stats. 
Yeah, and you, I, I'm, I'm just coming to that, Chairman, but thank you for, okay. for raising that. I'm just, just giving you the, the context before hopefully providing help to the, the committee. So on the 13th of June, you will be receiving, as will the public, um, statistics that cover the period 1 July to 31 December 2023, thereby covering the two quarters of 2023 where there are no current statistics in the public domain. Um, the current statistics, as, you, as I said in my earlier answer to you, cover the period up to the end of June 2023. Um, no other country in the world offers the level of transparency and frequency of publication that, that we do. Um, and then you asked about, well, what, what, what about after that period? So from <clears throat> the end of December, you know, October 23 onwards this year, for example. Um, as you know, the government's position is that we wouldn't usually publish additional portions of future data ahead of their official publication date. Um, however, due to the exceptional circumstances of this scenario and this issue and the interest of this committee and of the House and of the courts and of the media, I have asked officials to prepare an ad hoc data release on an exceptional basis, uh, which covers the period 7 October to the end of May this year, end of May 2024. Um, it will cover the number of extant licenses issued to Israel. It will cover the licenses currently being processed during that period and also provide the number of granted and refused licenses mm. since the 7th of October and the applications that have come in. I expect to be able to release those on or around the 7th of June this year, so in just over two weeks' time, and that will bring the data set right up to date to the end of May. You'll you yeah. appreciate, Mr Mayor, that that's completely unacceptable to the committee. Exactly. These are quarterly statistics. They're late. You're under a ministerial code obligation to answer in full to this committee, and we are asking you a question which you are empowered to answer. There is no legal obligation on you to withhold those statistics under the Statistics Act that is often quoted in these questions, but we would expect this to be answered today. Are you referring to the statistics that will be published on the 13th of June or the ad hoc data release? The most recent statistics available to you as a minister. Okay, well the statistics that are being prepared for the ad hoc release are not yet ready. Um, as you will probably appreciate, they're complicated, um, take time to get right, and I know the committee and the whole House has a strong interest in making sure these statistics are available to members and to others. So we want to get that right. And in two, just over two weeks, we will have a data set that is outside the normal cycle of publication, which will assist the committee and provide you with data that is right up to date. Why are the quarterly stats late? Why are you having to produce two quarters at the same time? Okay, I'm going to bring in Kate Joseph, this, but I, I can come back towards the end. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chairman, uh, and thank you, Minister, for the opportunity to just add to the overall picture. Um, the overall uh, picture. Kate, so, I want to know why the quarterly statistics are late. So we try and publish the quarterly statistics as quickly as possible, as you know. We aim to provide them usually within a sort of three to four month uh, time frame after the end of the period to which they refer. So yes, it's true that it has been longer than it would ordinarily be, and we are trying as quickly as we can to publish those statistics. Part of the reason for that is that we, um, as the committee might know, have been uh, updating our systems, uh, our digital systems. So we have been dual running our systems, and that's added to a level of complexity, and the work to update those systems um, has meant that it has just taken a little bit longer to get those statistics right. As, and as the committee knows um, we uh, take those statistics extremely seriously and we need to make sure that they are uh, absolutely correct, reliable, uh, trustworthy and so on. So that's not to, um, to, to, to make excuses for, for where we are. We're doing uh, that work as quickly as possible. An unfortunate and we're time to do that in the department's the life for these statistics not to be available. <laughs> So we'll publish them as soon as, as, as we possibly can. We've committed to the 13th of June. That is a little bit longer than we sometimes take, but we don't have a specific obligation for how quickly we publish them after the end of the time period. But a matter of global controversy. The UK's position is under intensive debate here in this Parliament, and you can't supply two members of this House stats which should have been published some time ago. I 
I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll defer back to the Minister on some of those points, but first of all, I'd say that, as the Minister referred to, our transparency is uh, considerably um, higher than a lot of other countries, certainly than most other countries, in terms of what we provide. It's not about other countries, yeah. Uh, if I may, this if is I may continue, the standard that this Parliament is seeking to set. So we we will publish that data from 2023 <laughs> on the 13th of June. What we are also doing, in addition, over and above our commitment to publish our data on a quarterly basis, mm. is agreeing to provide to, to the committee in early June much more up-to-date data on this particular issue on uh, uh, export licenses for Israel that will take us up to the end of this month, and that is fairly unprecedented. That's an ad hoc release on exceptional grounds. Um, and as you know, we provided information to the court earlier this year as well. So on, uh, on the issue of arms export licenses to Israel, we do have more up-to-date data than we have in terms of the global picture. We have well, data have up to the end of November twenty. provided to the courts? data that is more recent than the data you're providing to Parliament? We provided to the court uh, data that took us up to the end of November 23. Uh, that, that was not data, the full picture. No, has that data been provided to Parliament? So that data is now available to the court. What we're proposing to do, and, and therefore uh, members Wait, of the committee may have seen that, that issue data. For the minister. Are you telling us, are we hearing this correctly, that data provided to a court has not been provided to this Parliament? Well, the, the ad hoc data release is designed to give the committee and the whole of Parliament a comprehensive well, the question, view of the Mr. Max, The question it, is, has data been provided to the court that has not been provided to this Parliament? We have provided data to the court, and that data has, I believe, been made publicly available <coughs> by the uh, claimants uh, in court. Um, so, and, and what we are now doing is providing a further update to that. Because, because that's what happened with the court, if you'll allow me to explain that situation, because the data that we provided to the court was then made public, we are now committing to the committee that we will provide a more up-to-date version of that data that will take us up to the end of May because of our obligation to Parliament and to the as, committee to as provide we sit that data. Here today, <laughs> The courts of this land are better informed on the data for arms exports than the Parliament of this land. I think that data is now public, publicly available. I'm afraid that is a very poor approach to ministerial accountability. Mr Lord, do you have anything to further? I, I guess just a comment, and I wonder what the uh, Minister would think about this. Given the answers we've just received, what do you think the wider public and the media are going to make of the suggestions you've just made that you cannot provide evidence to this committee? It's such an important and timely uh, uh, cycle we're in just now. Well, I, I think the government and, and don't you think they'll well, be disappointed? No, no, I don't think they will. I think, I think are, they will. We are providing an ad hoc data release that, that, that is outside the normal cycle, and we'll bring the committee and the whole house up to date with the full picture since the conflict. With started. respect, Mr. Mac, uh, Minister Mac, this is since October 2023. We've been supplying licences to arms to export to Israel, and you've not been able to give any answer with respect to that time. Where it's at seven months, you haven't got a single answer to offer this committee. Do you not think the public and journalists who are here today and all those who have been uh, involved in focusing on this need to hear some answers and hear them now, not wait till the end of June? Well, I provided you with um, data around um, our licences uh, in the period up to 2022. Uh, I've also in 2024, sure, going into sure, June 24. Sure. And I'm, exp I'm explaining how we're going to provide the data that covers the conflict. We actually have worked hard at pace to create a data package that will be released um, on or around the 7th of June. And that will bring the committee and the whole house right up to date. It's much better to do this in a comprehensive way rather than re releasing tr small tranches. I'm going to move us on, but Mr Mack, you'll be aware that in response to my letter of the 4th of April, the department refused to provide information on the grounds that somehow it was subject to some sub problems. Those problems do not exist, of course, because the sub waiver covers information to this parliament. You're now telling us that the courts have more up-to-date information than has been supplied to parliament, and we are 48 hours ahead of a debate in Parliament on arms export controls to Parliament. I think I speak on behalf of the whole committee when I say we are deeply unimpressed by your ability to provide up-to-date information to this department, and that will obviously have 
implications for the way this department has to approach its armed scrutiny work over the days and the weeks to come. Can I come back on a few of those points? Of course. Yeah. So on the sub judice point, the Secretary of State wrote back to you just to confirm that she was not seeking to use sub judice um, in relation to that issue. Um, she was simply saying that the government doesn't comment on legal proceedings, which is a long-standing convention, and obviously the Deputy Foreign Secretary and I and Kate are here to answer your question, so there's no question of using sub judice to, as a shield by which we wouldn't answer your questions. We, we clearly, are, clearly are. And in respect of the core question that Mr Law and you've, 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 you've an, asked about is, is the government forthcoming, open, transparent about providing data to you? We're very keen to do that. We recognise the interest from your committee yeah. in the House and the courts, and we are providing you with a comprehensive, uh, methodical data set as quickly as we can. Mm. I would suggest an alternative approach would have been to lay the evidence you gave to the court in the library when you submitted it to the court. Mr. Thank you, Chair. Minister Mack. The Minister for the Armed Forces previously claimed that the UK had provided no lethal or military equipment to Israel since the 7th of October 2023. This was subsequently amended to say the UK government has provided. To set the record absolutely straight, has the UK exported lethal military and or security goods to Israel since the 7th of October 2023? Thank you very much. So by way of background, the UK government doesn't uh, sell or ship defence exports to Israel or provide lethal aid directly, unlike say the United States which, which does do that from a state to state perspective what we do in the UK is we license private companies some of which you'll be aware of to export um, products to, to Israel that does include defence exports as I said in my opening remarks to Mr Law um, that counts for less than 1% of Israel's defence imports so in other words we export a relatively small amount of kit to um, Israel when, it look, when, when you look at it from an import perspective um, we have the strategic export licensing criteria, which you'll be familiar with. That is the framework around which we make our decisions and where licenses conform to those guidelines, and we will allow the, the, the export to take place. But just to be very clear, the UK government doesn't sell or manufacture or ship arms to Israel, but we do have a, a rigorous licensing regime for companies that, that do do that and it's legitimate that Israel has a right to self-defense as you we all know it has been attacked horrifically um, over its history including in recent times so it does have a legitimate right to defend itself um, but the um, products that are exported from the UK are done by private companies not the government. So on that basis why was that amendment made because that actually takes it further away from what you're saying because the original statement was that the UK provided no military or lethal equipment but it was amended to say that the UK government has provided no lethal or military equipment, which actually is, is, is a, goes the opposite way to your clarification. I'm not aware of, of what the context of that statement was or, or, or why it was made or what the, the wider sort of environment in which made. But I can clarify that the UK government doesn't manufacture uh, or sell directly defence products to the Israelis, but we do licence private companies to do so. Understood. Thank you. Since 2008, the quantity of licences granted for the export of targeting equipment was the third highest after radar and electronic warfare components. A further 15% of the value of every F-35 exported to Israel is also produced in the UK, which Israeli military sources report are being used in Gaza. How confident are you that export categories such as these will not be used to facilitate violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, thank you. So I mentioned that the um, SELC, as we would call it, the criteria, is the framework by which we would assess uh, exports, including defence exports, to, to Israel. Um, as I also said, Israel is a long-standing bilateral trade and defence partner. We have a long-standing relationship with Israel, and therefore we do licence the export of defence products to them. Um, these range from components for vehicles, um, some of the products that you mentioned, as well as um, uh, UAVs, etc., etc. Um, even though the, 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 the numbers are small, our relationship is important with, it, with Israel, and the Foreign Secretary conducts an assessment, which you will also be aware of, which is evidence-based around 
Israel's compliance with international humanitarian law and the test is whether there is a clear risk that anything we export from the UK would be used for a serious violation of international humanitarian law and the, and, and the assessment is that that threshold has not been met and therefore the position remains unchanged and we continue to support Israel and license exports for defence in a very rigorous, methodical, technical way. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I, I'm not sure. Can I be, can I be very clear? Mm. Are you confident that targeting equipment and F-35, the contribution from the UK being part of that, mm. are not being used to facilitate violations of international humanitarian law? Well, our process is evidence-based, uh, including um, <coughs> information that goes to the Foreign Secretary and the FCDO, which then feeds into our process. We have a very clear test for what we would license and not license, and therefore, if the threshold is not met, then the licensing will be, will be allowed. So I am confident. Thank you. Stephen Bottom. Thank you, Chair. Minister Matt, we've just been talking about the F-35 programme. Um, I declare an interest. There are hundreds of jobs in Burnley reliant on that programme. And if you look at it, it's one of a number of air, you know, major aircraft programmes, Typhoon, F-35, now GCAP, reliant on multinational consortia coming together. I wonder, and the Deputy Foreign Secretary might want to share a view on this, I wonder what you think it would do for the UK to take a position on F-35 component exports for the rest of the global consortia we work with, and whether that could then have an impact on other programmes that we work in global uh, relationships with. Well, thank you. You're, you're right that the UK is a key member of the F-35 programme, which is a, a multinational programme um, involving our, our, our allies, obviously America, American-led. Um, we supply around 15% of the components of the aircraft during assembly and repair, and we also supply components like the ejector seats for the, the aircraft. Now, the majority of the components are um, exported to um, global supply hubs and global um, logistics hubs where other, other members of the F-35 partnership can draw on those parts as, as, as needed. But when we allow exports, as I mentioned um, to, to your colleague, we use the strategic export licensing criteria for that as well, even though that's a quite a famous programme, it, it, it uses the same criteria as, as any other um, less famous exports and the test is, is the same and therefore we have not found those exports to violate those criteria and therefore they, they are allowed, but as you, as you rightly say we have international partners involved in that, in that programme and we continue to engage with them on defence, diplomacy and, and security issues. I wonder if I could press you a little bit more though. In the last couple of years we've seen an example on Typhoon where Germany had some objections to the export of Typhoon to uh, I think it was Saudi Arabia at the time. Um, now that did have uh, will have had implications for Germany's reputation as a reliable partner in some of these global con consortium that you just can't do some of these big projects without. Do you worry that if the UK went down the same route, that would have an impact on our reputation as a dependable partner? Well, I think the UK is an important part of the F-35 programme. As you know, it's a fifth generation jet that is used by many countries around the world, our, our allies. And I want the UK to be seen as a capable uh, defence partner. I've returned from a, a meeting only last week with some of our international allies in relation to GCAP, the, the, the programme you mentioned, which obviously is a separate programme, but we do have a good reputation um, for defence innovation, and the F-35 programme is important. Um, I'm not aware that any of our allies involved in the programme at a national government level have chosen to suspend any extant licences to, to Israel, and the F-35 programme continues and I want us to maintain our reputation as a reliable partner but that doesn't prevent us from engaging with our allies on um, the issues around the, the Middle East or in any other, other theatre. You know, we speak frankly to them as the Deputy Foreign Secretary will, will tell you but in terms of the F-35 programme it, it remains important. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, on this question? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm okay. Oh, okay. Can I just check? Was any UK supplied equipment used in the World Convoy attack? Mm. We have no evidence that it was. Mm -hmm. And was any UK sourced equipment used in the lethal attack on medical aid for Palestine in January? You have any? Can I, can, I, can I help, uh, Chair? Um, uh, we have not so far been able to identify any UK licences for any components or equipment for use by the IDF with the Hermes 450, which is the drone which is alleged to have been used in relation to the World Central Kitchen strike. It may be helpful if I just add for the committee that in the last 10 years we've granted a small number of export licences to Israel for both this drone type, that is the Hermes uh, 450 and specially designed components for this drone. However, none of these were for the use of the Israeli Defence Forces. And so, as far as you know, there was no UK sourced equipment used in the lethal attack on medical aid for Palestine in January? As far as I know, that is the case. Okay. Can I just add a, a quick supplementary? Does that include software that may be uh, used in terms of uh, operations? Um, as, as far as I know, uh, the answer to that question is no, but, Chair, if I find that uh, there's any remote um, uh, contribution made, because that's quite a wide question, I will, of course, write to the committee. Thank you very much. Mr McDonald. Uh, thank you, Chair. Before I ask one question, can I just return to Minister Mack? Mm. I think in terms of the F-35, basic premise is that we're part of a global consortium and we want to cooperate with that. Um, are, are you trying to suggest to the committee that somehow... No, we'll ask you the question. Are the parts identifiable, the ones that will be produced in this country, that enter into the programme? Do we know what they are? Are they identifiable? I understand that they are. I mean, this is really a matter for the MOD in, in terms of its sort of level of components, but um, I understand that you know, we, we would know what those were. So if the decision was to Im impose sanctions and to, 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 to terminate a licence, that wouldn't uh, be any fetter to your, to, to your contribution to the programme because it would be specifically about parts that would be destined for deployment in uh, the, this conflict. Is that right? Didn't quite get your question. Would you mind well, repeating it? If, if, it is, if a part is identifiable mm. uh, and you know where it's going to be used, mm. then presumably if you chose to make a decision to uh, terminate an export licence, that wouldn't have an adverse impact upon the consortium that you, you, you've referred to. That work would go on unabated. It's just simply that those parts could not be used for deployment in this conflict. Is that, is that not right? Well, we well, I think that, that we are an important part of the consortium. So I, I accept and, that. And, and you know, our, our contribution is around 15%, as I said to, to, your, to your colleague. Uh, that includes ejector seats and other parts. I must admit that in terms of the other parts, that's more for the MOD rather than, than, than for us. But, but it's but, not going to fly without but, an ejector seat. But, but, the, but the evidence suggests, this is an evidence-led assessment, is that the, the, the criteria have, have been met. There is no problem with us being part of the F-35 consortium and therefore those parts continue to be sent to... So it's the overarching assessments that's dominant here, not, not the parts themselves. Is that, is that what you're saying to me? Well, we, we have a, a two-layered um, assessment. We look at each individual licence on a case-by-case -case basis and as I said to Mr Higginbottom, the fact that it's the F-35 and is famous doesn't make it any different to any other component. So we apply the same rigour and methodological um, rigour to that assessment as we would other parts. Um, the tests are comprehensive and the criteria have been met so those parts continue to be, to be used and on a broader perspective our role in the F-35 programme remains very important uh, to us as a country and as Mr. Well, that, well, that's said... that's helpful because you're saying the criteria is the dominant yeah. uh, impact. Can I, can I move us on because I'm not conscious of time. Uh, Minister Mitchell, uh, what is the UK government's most current assessment of yeah. Israel's intent and capability to comply with international humanitarian law? Um, Chair, I think it might be helpful if you agree if I just set out what the process is um, and then the, the context will be clear. The government assess all export license applications on a case-by-case -case basis against strategic export licensing criteria. These criteria constitute guidance as required by the Export Control Act 2002. We last revised and laid the criteria 
before Parliament on the 8th of December 2021. It is for the Secretary of State for Business and Trade, as the Committee knows, to decide whether to amend, suspend or revoke any relevant licences or to refuse any new licence applications. The Foreign Secretary has a responsibility to provide advice to the Secretary of State for Business and Trade in accordance with the criteria to inform these decisions. It is Criterion 2C yeah. that makes clear that the Government will, and I quote, not grant a licence if it determines there is a clear risk that the items might be used to commit or facilitate a serious violation of international humanitarian law. Uh, the Foreign Secretary's advice follows a methodology that the Court of Appeal accepted in judicial reviews. It draws on open source evidence, intelligence, accounts of diplomatic and ministerial engagement, and correspondence with the relevant country, in this case Israel. The analysis considers any patterns, trends or systemic weaknesses that might exist in the country's compliance with IHL. The IHL analysis is carried out by a team in the Foreign Office. Based on that, the Export Controls Joint Unit offer advice on that, and that assessment means in terms of export licences for the Foreign Secretary to offer advice to the Business and Trade Secretary. The Foreign Secretary announced on the 9th of April that having reviewed the most recent advice about the situation in, in Gaza and Israel's conduct, and this is the answer to Mr. McDonald's question, Minister had dis ministers have decided that the UK position on export licences remains unchanged. So, opposite the criteria of intent and capability, the UK government's judgment is that Israel is in a satisfactory place on intent and capability. Uh, if that's the case, um, with reference to the ongoing operation in Rafah, you said alongside Lord Cameron and Lord Ahmed on multiple separate occasions that Israel does not have a credible plan to protect civilians. And without a credible plan in place, how can Israel demonstrate intent and capability to comply with international humanitarian law? Well, that, that's, with respect, that's not quite what we said. What we said is that uh, we do not think an operation <clears throat> in Rafa should go ahead without there being a proper uh, plan, and that we have seen no such plan, and, and therefore our position remains well, that without you... seeing that plan should not go ahead. Well, if you haven't seen the plan, how can you declare yourself content around Israel's intent and capability. You have no evidence. We have a chart in front of us where you take things through certain steps. If that doesn't exist, how can it possibly be that you declare yourself satisfied if you have not seen a plan? Well, the, 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 the significant operation in Rafa has, uh, it appears, has not yet started, and therefore... We would not be. 600,000 people had to move. If that's not significant, 600,000. Okay. If that's not significant, then what is? Well, well, it's true. And the Israeli Defence Force uh, warned 400,000 to move, and 800,000 uh, have moved. And we are seeking, along with our allies, to uh, take care of them in the best way we can. The committee will know that British aid has been delivered both um, by, on, by by maritime means and the pier which pierced the beach now. The, the um, displacement so of 800,000 people would imply quite a significant operation, no? Well, they, they've given a warning that 400,000 should go, 800,000 have chosen to go. But that of itself would not uh, lead us to make a change in its assessment. It's important to recognise that there is a very robust legal process here. It's set out in an act of uh, Parliament. It's a rolling legal process. It ends with advice as I set out a moment ago, to the Business Secretary from the Foreign uh, Secretary. The, the, the issue we are asked to adjudge is does Israel have commitment, capability and compliance under the lines of uh, Criterion 2C, which I uh, set out. When we look at it, we take account of humanitarian issues, issues to do with detainees, the military conduct of uh, the IDF. So we're not required to say that Israel has a clean uh, bill of health and while we don't publish or comment on legal advice we always act in a way consistent 
with it, and that is the judgment we then mm. deliver to the House and to this committee. Go on, Mr. McDonald. Well, well the, the, the government previously supplied some of its IHL assessments to the High Court, yes, uh, which are now a public knowledge. And the government has stated, and the courts have agreed, that political responsibility for these decisions depends upon parliamentary scrutiny. So we're coming back to the same issue. So why is the government refusing to provide information that might explain its decisions to this committee and to Parliament? Because well, there'll be f other assessments beyond those that have been disclosed. Well, we, we are acting, and Mr Byrne is an extremely distinguished and senior member of a past government, so he knows how the situation works. We are acting absolutely in accordance in this with uh, the precedent of past governments. Governments do not publish their legal advice, which is, is wh where Mr. MacDonald is, is, is uh, perfectly properly heading, but we do not publish uh, legal advice. The exception um, is only that there has been a summary of advice when British troops are being committed uh, in action, and the House will remember the uh, precedent from Iraq when David Cameron, now the Foreign Secretary, then the Prime Minister, committed British troops in, in Libya. He did uh, precisely that. And the then Attorney General Dominic Grieve presented that uh, summary of legal advice. This position, the position today uh, in this appalling catastrophe that has befallen it's, it's, Gaza is, is different from that, and we are proceeding in precisely the same way. Govern, all, governments of all parties proceed in these circumstances. The scale of this is, 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 is enormous, and you talk about 600,000 people moving. By 800,000, 800, and, and some have chosen to go. What choice did they have to move? Was this just, I, th I think I want to go and live somewhere else? I mean, it's, well, it's, isn't that a preposterous, preposterous suggestion to think that this is a matter of free will to say I'm going to move somewhere else? No, the, the, the issue you... So what you're saying to me is I've set out the government's structure, the, the strategy that governments follow... Uh, never re revealing the legal advice, but acting always in accordance uh, with it. I said, and you're saying to me um, that uh, this situation is so awful, should we not depart from that precedent? And my answer to you is, well, I, no, we should not depart I'm, from I'm it. I'm saying that on the basis of credible NGOs, international bodies and partner countries, that the threshold has long since been reached. And, it's, and people in this country and across the world are bewildered that the UK government doesn't come to the same conclusion. What, what else has to happen before you would deem Israel to be in breach of international well, humanitarian law? Well, I think, I think it's incredibly important that these decisions are not reached at the whim of a minister at the dispatch box responding to the mood in Parliament for the, what is being said in a committee. It has to be with a process. I've set out, I hope helpfully to the committee, exactly how that process operates. And, uh, Mr MacDonald, I don't think you would expect ministers to operate outside those parameters of any no, party. And to your, to your point about the 800,000 people who now <clears throat> have decided to move, 400,000 of them want to do so by the IDF, uh, they have moved as a result of the circumstances. We, on a rolling process, we continue to evaluate all these things. But as of now, there is no change to what the Foreign Secretary set out in April in Washington. Can I just bring a focus back to your judgment, your judgment as a minister, about this point about intent to observe international humanitarian law? So, uh, in your introductory answer, you set out, as is, as you set out very eloquently to Parliament on a number of occasions, that a judgment about intent to comply is an important component in the way that you come to a judgment. That's quite right. Lord Ahmed <coughs> said to the Foreign Affairs Committee on the 14th of May, I think Israel is really leaving many of its partners, current, including ourselves, pretty challenged on where we are currently on the issue of international humanitarian law and how they are fulfilling their obligations. There is no plan. Israel has not shown us a credible plan. You get a leaflet in the morning that says you must move by the afternoon. It's a pretty stark choice. So the, the question that we've got is on this, and we're going to go through each component in the decision-making framework and we're going to start with intent. And if we can't see a credible plan to adhere to international humanitarian law in RAFA, we're trying to understand how you've made a judgment that, yes, Israel will, uh, does have the intent to honour international humanitarian law. How can you come to that judgment in the absence of seeing a plan? 
Well, this is the uh, result of a legal process which, upon which we, we do not comment, but we follow the results of the legal advice that we receive. And on the issue of intent, um, you will know, Chair, that uh, in much the same way as in Britain, we have legal advice in issues of targeting and lawyers embedded in troops which take decisions. The Israeli system is very similar. And so, so when we judge intent, we take into account a huge uh, range of things. And incidentally, when we, I think I set out the, the various sources, uh, open source, what, what uh, uh, various uh, NGOs and so forth say, we take all those things into account. But on intent, which you specifically <coughs> mentioned, the example I give you about the legal entity <coughs> being embedded inside the decision-making process, I think is quite an important pointer. So even as you've said, and as Lord Ahmed has said, and as Lord Cameron has said, even in the absence of a credible plan to protect civilians, you have still reached a judgment that Israel has the intent to comply with international humanitarian law. We, we have no reason. Uh, we, we, we did our assessment, and the Foreign Secretary announced it in Washington, and that remains the assessment of the government. And was that his assessment, or was that the advice put to him? So he reaches his conclusions on the basis of the advice he receives. He then communicates those to uh, uh, Mr. Max, Secretary of State. Um, but uh, he receives the government's legal advice, and he acts in accordance with that. And as I've already pointed out, for reasons which are heavily precedented, uh, and which uh, you, Chair, will understand, we don't publish that legal advice. You're inviting the committee to believe that even in the absence of a plan to protect civilians in Rafa, and given everything you've said, you're inviting us to believe that you still believe that there is intent to comply with international humanitarian law. The, the uh, position today is unchanged, and therefore that includes the question no, you are sir. asking me, since April the 9th when the Foreign Secretary made his statement in Washington. Do you believe today, Mr Mitchell, do you believe as the Minister that Israel currently has the intent to comply with international humanitarian law in Rafa? It does not matter, Chair, what I believe. What is important is the legal process which informs that decision. Uh, that legal process continues on a rolling basis. It, the Foreign Secretary will receive the uh, legal advice, and when he receives the legal advice, he will make a uh, judgment. But uh, as he has always confirmed, and as I reconfirm, he acts in accordance with that advice. Exactly. He, as a minister, takes the decision, not the lawyers. And that is why it is important to this committee what you think, as the minister, that will help shape the decision. Well, I'm, so, I'm, I'm not the minister who makes the decision. The decision is made by the Foreign Secretary uh, in this process which I have uh, described. And, of course, uh, I uh, completely accept that process and uh, accept the decision that the Foreign Secretary uh, makes. And he then, but they, he then communicates that uh, to the Secretary of State uh, for DBT, and she then uh, exercises her judgment uh, in accordance with that. So this is a question that we would need to put to Lord Cameron. Well, no, I mean, he'll give you the same answer. I suspect that I will be giving you, well, and that I am no. giving you. It's well, his, his decision. You're saying you support it. Do you the, agree with him? It, the, 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 the question is, does the minister taking the decision believe that Israel has the intent to comply with international humanitarian law in a and, and, and the answer is he would not have made the decision that he did unless he did believe that. Hara, did you want to follow up? Yes, thank you, Chair. Do um, you think it would be fair to say that any reasonable person tuning into this committee today would say that it's quite obvious that this government are finding political reasons to get the evidence to fit the criteria because they are desperately, for political reasons, want to continue to sell arms to Israel? when the evidence is simply not there? Uh, no, uh, Mr Har, I would not uh, expect those uh, tuning in to uh, this important committee to reach those conclusions. Indeed, I would hope they would reach the reverse, that ministerial whim uh, 
um, going with the flow of a committee or a feeling in the House on any particular day uh, is not the right way to reach these decisions. You need to reach the decisions through a very careful process. I've tried to lay out for the committee precisely what that process uh, is. And it's right that ministers should act on the basis of legal advice. Uh, that is the basis of the rule of law. We act on the basis of legal advice. We don't uh, publish it, but we act in accordance uh, with it. And, and, and bear in mind that you know we get judiciously, judicially reviewed from time to time, and therefore you know we have to be absolutely certain that we act uh, in the way I have set out for the committee. Well, let, let me ask you about the, the rule of law. Does the UK government regard international humanitarian law as an absolute or is it a spectrum? Well, international humanitarian law uh, and, and, and the, the criteria under which we assess whether a country is abiding by international humanitarian law are precisely what I have set out. You know, we have, no, we, have, we, have profound, we have profound concerns about the humanitarian position inside Rafa, but that is separate from the issue of whether or not yep. the criteria have been reached, so which mean that we would determine that. What I want breach. to do is I want to go back to the rule of law which you brought up, and I'll ask again, does the UK government regard international humanitarian law as an absolute or is it a spectrum? Well, it has to be interpreted, and that is why we have the okay. advantage of legal advice in making that interpretation. It goes back to the point I was making before, that this is not for the, the whim of a minister. This is for a proper process with the different stages which I have set out, okay. well, properly, let, properly conducted. Let me go back then to 2019, and in the evidence to the Court of Appeal regarding weapons sales to Saudi Arabia, the UK government said in terms of the use of those weapons in Yemen, that Saudi breaches of international humanitarian law fell, and I quote, well within the margin of error that would be expected of a conflict of this nature. Now, where in the Geneva Convention it says, you know, that it's acceptable to have a, a margin of error in international humanitarian law, I don't know. But is the government then using that principle that used for Saudi in 2019 that there is an acceptable margin of error within hum international humanitarian law in assessing its decisions on Israel. Well, well, I wasn't uh, privy to those discussions. Yes, but you are here on behalf but, of the UK government. Well, but but also, uh, as uh, you may recall, Mr. O'Hara, I was then profoundly opposed to the government's policy on uh, Yemen. And uh, so uh, I certainly was not involved in the decisions and discussions that were going on then about this. But, you know, I've been very clear. The, the key question we have to ask ourselves, ministers have to ask ourselves, the, the duty that the Foreign Secretary has to discharge is does Israel have commitment, capability and compliance? And the judgment that the government has made on the basis of legal advice is what was set out by I, the Foreign Secretary. I hear what you're saying, but what I want to find out is is this government acting within margins of error when it comes to compliance with international humanitarian law? It's said it, in its own words, it said it's done it before in terms of Yemen and Saudi. So is that still the policy now? And if it is, what are those margins of errors within which it works? Well, I'm not aware that the policy has changed uh, since then. Um, but the process you are asking me about is precisely as I have set out to the committee, and I really don't think I can helpfully add to that. Yeah, but you, you must understand from this committee's point of view and from parliamentarians' point of view that very rarely do any of us actually get to speak or address or question the Foreign Secretary. Therefore, your position is instead of the Foreign Secretary, and when we are seeking deep policy positions within the UK government, you are the person that we have to go to. And so the question is, what are the margins of error the UK government works to within international humanitarian law? Well, let, so let, let me be clear about that. Firstly, if Lord Cameron were here, he would, I believe, be giving precisely the same answers that I am uh, giving. Uh, as uh, the chairman of the committee knows very well, government is seamless. Uh, 
uh, collective responsibility determines that. So you'll be getting the same response from Lord Cameron. Secondly, just in case this was behind your question, Lord Cameron is extremely available. He appears before the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. He's going to do so again uh, shortly. These questions uh, that you are asking me will undoubtedly be asked of him on those occasions. And I think you will get the response. Now, in terms of any lassitude, which is what's behind your question, I've set out the legal process. The legal process uh, makes the proper judgment, uh, and ministers act in accordance with the advice that they are given. And I really I don't think I can be any more helpful than uh, uh, that, Mr. Okay. O'Hara. I, I, I fear you're right. You have to move us on, Mr. Law. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been listening to what you've been saying, Deputy Foreign Secretary, and I know you have to wear two hats because you're also Minister for International Development and Aid on the Ground, and I heard you talk about the profound concerns you have about humanitarian man-made crisis that's in um, Rafa just now. So I want to bring our attention to Rafa, notwithstanding the starvation in northern Gaza. But just going back, Lord Cameron mentioned that the UK will oppose a major operation in Rafa without a clear plan, quote-unquote, to protect civilians. Now, we've already established today that there's no clear plan. I don't know what a major operation looks like, but given that almost half the population has fled for their lives through leaflets that have been dropped over them from the IDF, I wanted to ask, what would your opposition uh, look like, and how will you make sure that arms export licences are being considered as part of the UK's overall response? Well, we are uh, clear, um, Mr Lord, uh, that we would not support a major operation in Rafa unless there is a very clear plan for how to protect people and save lives. And as I said earlier, Chair, we've not seen that plan, and in these circumstances we would not support a major operation in Rafa. But, but what uh, he asked me, uh, um, Mr Law asked me about the attitude of the British government to what is happening in Rafa. We, we are doing numerous things. We are trying to get aid in. We press the Israeli government on a daily basis to get more aid in, preferably by road, which is by far the easiest way to help. And on that point, can we ask how long has the Rafa border been closed? Well, the, the, the truth is that, they, that effectively nothing has got through Rafa mm. effectively since, Does that about, say the since, about, government's not since about the 6th of May. But the reason for that is that in order for... Uh, humanitarian supplies to flow in Rafa, there needs to be a deal between Egypt and Israel. So, so that, that is not a point that can be laid uh, exclusively at the feet of Israel. So when, when um, Mr. Law asks me what the government is doing, we are seeking to increase the flow in every possible way we can. And because we can't get it in by road, we are using these uh, very expensive and unwieldy airdrops and also seeking to take stuff over long distances by sea uh, onto a pontoon and then onto the beach. So, so uh, we are that, we're doing... That doesn't sound like a scenario um, mm. that one should face when working with a country that has intent to comply with international well, humanitarian law. Well, um, you know, one would not wish to face it, but this is uh, the position of Israel was that on October the 7th, more Jewish people uh, lost their lives in a pogrom uh, that had not been seen since uh, 1945 and the end of the uh, Holocaust. So. That is why uh, the government says, and I uh, repeat uh, extensively in the House of Commons, that Israel has the right of self-defense but must abide within international humanitarian law, which is at the heart of what we're discussing this afternoon. Well, but, al but also, um, Mr. Byrne, that uh, we need to uh, do everything we can to get to a sustainable ceasefire so that uh, on the day after mm -hmm. uh, we can move to a position um, where there is a serious and proper political process that delivers the two-state solution. And on that point, do you accept that starvation is being used as a weapon of war, given the fact that the UN figures, particularly in northern Gaza, but also across Gaza just now, the numbers of children that are dying from starvation and malnutrition? And you're talking about how much effort you're making to try and get aid in, which I fully accept, but that aid's not been getting in since the war began. I was out in Egypt in February hearing exactly that. In fact, the aid that's getting in now is a lot less than what there was even before the war began. And even then, at that point, at least Gazans, people in Gaza themselves, could su supplement the food from what they could grow. That's no longer sustainable. So do you accept then 
that under the current circumstances, as you said yourself, there are profound concerns of what's going on. And I know I'm asking you to put your minister's hat on here, that starvation could be used as a weapon of war, and that would breach international humanitarian law, and would certainly ask us to reconsider our arms export licences. So, so uh, you cannot use starvation as a weapon of war and remain within international humanitarian law. So that, that, so that is clear. But uh, the judgment that is made, and uh, we exercise that judgment on the basis of specific legal advice on these matters, um, and on the basis of that uh, legal advice, we reach our conclusion. And as I have set out, uh, as of today, this is a rolling process, but as of today, the uh, judgment that has been made by the Foreign Secretary is the one that was announced in, in Washington. Can I just check, is it your yeah. assessment that people are dying because of lack of access to aid? Uh, whether or not that was my assessment would not directly affect judgments on international humanitarian uh, law, because the question is uh, upon the issue of compliance um, and um, uh, commitment and capability. But uh, we are extremely worried about the position of children uh, and, and everyone, really, in Gaza and the rising IPC figures. And that is why we are doing everything we can to make sure that Israel honors the promise it made to uh, flood Gaza with aid and increase uh, back to 500 the number of trucks that are getting in. Well, the, the Minister for the Middle East has said the facilities in hospitals are dire and people are dying because of a lack of medicine support and basic amenities. Do you share that analysis? Well, I, th I think the position of the hospitals is absolutely terrible, and the Minister of the Middle East, of course, is absolutely right to say that. That is why Britain and others absolutely are right working with uh, Israel to try and make sure that we get into uh, Gaza the necessary uh, food and medicines and shelter particularly. There were 8,000 shelter kits that were landed from Britain um, at the weekend. Um, and also why our field hospital there has moved to a place where it can provide more a treatment than, uh, than it could where it was and has treated thousands and thousands of people. Brendan O'Hara, very briefly. Very, very quickly. Uh, can I ask you the same question I asked Lord Ahmed at the Foreign Affairs Committee last week? That why, in your opinion, are children dying of hunger and malnutrition in an area of the world in which food is plentiful, just 44 miles from Tel Aviv, why are they dying? Because of the results of the appalling attack on October the well, 7th. That's not the reason. The, the, the uh, extraordinary so, so uh, can terrorist I just, attack so, by so Hamas the, on that so, day. So the appalling atrocity of October the 7th led to crop failures? Led to what? I mean, what, what's the direct link between that appalling atrocity and the death of innocent children from hunger 44 miles from Tel Aviv? in an area of the world where food is plentiful. Draw that line for me, so, please. So uh, on the issue of crop failure, that is a longer term uh, issue for the uh, region. But uh, it is the direct impact of the attack on October the 7th, to which Israel has an absolute right of self-defense. But they must act within humanitarian okay, I'm gonna move, So, I'm gonna move, so I'm that gonna, is the answer to Mr. O'Hara's uh, question. Um, Deputy Foreign Secretary, can I just check we've done our best to reflect on this diagram the evidence that you've given to courts uh, and Lord Cameron has given to the Foreign Affairs Committee um, and I believe you did say earlier in your evidence today that the government the government does take into account past breaches of international humanitarian law when it determines how reliable assurances of intent capacity and commitment are is that correct well the government takes into account uh, all these things in reaching, uh, I set out the different areas which, upon which we have to make a judgment. If it sets into, a, 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 in, into takes into account all of those things um, in its assessment of commitment, capability, and compliance. Yeah, so, so past breaches is one of those factors. So past breaches or potential past breaches of international humanitarian law is one of those factors that's weighed in the balance. Yes, and it would, it would you know, obviously it depends whether or not uh, the breach uh, is um, at variance with commitment, capability and compliance. Yeah. Uh, during the conflict in Yemen, I believe it was the Ministry of Defence that kept a tracker database of continued, uh, almost a continued register of potential um, international humanitarian law violations. 
Um, does such a database exist either in your department or Mr Mack in your department uh, with regard to the conflict in Gaza? Well, I'm not aware of it existing in um, my department. I'm also not aware of it existing in our department. Are you aware that such a database might exist in the Ministry of Defence? I'm not aware that such a database in that form exists. Mr. Mitchell. I'm uh, not aware, but perhaps I could, we could, uh, we could double-check and write to you on that point. That would be um, very kind. Now, I, I ask about um, potential and real IHL violations and how you consider them, uh, because in the summary defence that you've provided to the courts last year, um, you say something important at paragraph 43, which is on page 17 of that defence document. And I'll, you're no doubt familiar with it, but I'll, I'll just read it for the benefit of the record. Uh, it says, it, it is quoting from uh, an IHL assessment that the government has made, uh, and it says, although Israel has accepted that it was under an obligation to facilitate, but not provide humanitarian assistance in Gaza, the Israeli response gave no details of the reason for restricting the quantity of supplies of food, water and medical supplies. The decision of the Israeli cabinet on the 18th of October 2023 had linked the supply of humanitarian assistance to the release of hostages. The assessment noted that the absence of further explanation raised concerns regarding uh, the commitment to comply with the obligation not to arbitrarily deny access to humanitarian assistance and was relevant to an assessment of Israel's overall commitment to um, international humanitarian law. Now, as, as we read this, a number of conclusions jump out. So the first conclusion that jumps out is that the government considers that there is an obligation to facilitate humanitarian aid and not to restrict supplies of food, water and medical supplies. Second, it would appear that the government considers that Israel has breached this obligation uh, it says in the note, restricting the quantity of supplies, and that is recorded as a fact. Uh, it notes that there's been uh, no response, uh, but it then crucially notes that there was additional evidence that the decision of the Israeli government was what happened to link the provision of supplies to the release of hostages. Uh, and that's significant, obviously, on intentionality. So that, that would look to us as the government basically saying to the courts, yes, there has been a breach of international humanitarian law. But, Mr Mitchell, have I read that correctly? Well, I think, I think um, uh, the most helpful thing I can do in answering that is, is um, make clear that in reaching any conclusion... Uh, engagement with the government of Israel is an important part of the process and the evidence base of the assessments includes an analysis of four things. The overall nature and dynamics of the conflict, which is very important in the context Mr Bernard just raised, covering the political, military, humanitarian and human rights context, the statements made by credible NGOs, international bodies and partner countries relating to the country's adherence to international humanitarian law, evidence from the country in question, including statements made by its government and military representatives, and information regarding its military structures, processes, and training, and the country's record of compliance, including legal yeah. analysis of specific allegations of IHL I've violations. The, I've got the framework on the screen. I'm, so, what, what I'm just trying to drive at, so we understand the framework, and I'm very grateful to you for setting it out again for us. Um, that, but that is, that is the basis. I understand that, but what I'm zeroing in on here is uh, D. We've got it listed on the diagram yeah. in front of you there. The country's record of compliance, including analysis of specific alleged IHL violations. It, it would appear in the court documents that uh, His Majesty's Government has provided that the government does accept that there was an IHL violation in the linking of the issue around unacceptable retention of hostages and the provision or facilitation of aid. And I'm asking you, do you accept that there was a violation of international humanitarian law in that instance? Well, that, that, that may, there may or may not have been, but in terms of the inquiry that the committee is conducting, uh, that is an issue upon which legal advice would be given and received by the Foreign Secretary. And on the basis of that uh, legal advice, 
he would then reach his conclusions on whether or not uh, international humanitarian law had been uh, breached, whether, as I, I keep repeatedly say, the three key criteria under 2C were breached, and then uh, he would reach his conclusions. But, but the assessment of that would, would be on the basis, would come to him through uh, legal advice, which he would then consider before reaching his judgment. Okay. Well, uh, you will have no doubt seen the US State Department report to Congress uh, under Section 2 of the National Security Memorandum. Um, and you'll no doubt know that it concluded, uh, and I'm quoting here, it's reasonable to assess that defence articles covered under NSM 20, which is the act in question, have been used by Israeli security forces since October 7th in instances inconsistent with its IHL obligations or with established best practices for mitigating civilian harm. Are you aware of that conclusion from the United States? Um, the answer to uh, your question, Mr Byrne, is that we, uh, we note what our allies and partners uh, conclude and do on all these matters, but we have our own processes and we stick religiously to uh, those. So although we note what other countries uh, are doing, and I have a long list here of what other countries are doing, mm -hmm. it is for ministers, for the Foreign Office and the Department of Business and Trade, to follow the Acts of Parliament and the uh, regulations which I have set right. out in my first answer um, uh, to Mr. Law um, and to act on that basis. And the fact that another country, and even be it a very close friend like America, might have a different structure or different conclusions even is irrelevant. We use our own systems and we reach our own conclusions. I appreciate we use our own systems, but it's not irrelevant, is it? Because in the criteria that you've set out and rehearsed for several times this afternoon, uh, under C, here on the diagram, one of the factors that you do consider is evidence from the country in question, including government statements and information on military structures and training. And then in B, you take into account statements by credible NGOs, international bodies, and partner countries. Indeed. So you weigh this evidence from the United States yes. when making a decision. But the important word is weigh, um, mm -hmm. Chairman. Uh, the, the, uh, we take all those things into account, but and other countries' processes indeed as well, but we reach our own conclusions on the very precise basis that I set out for the committee. Uh, and you'll also be aware, because you've commented on this in, in public in the last 24 hours, um, of the statements made by the International uh, Criminal Court in the issue of arrest warrants, um, and you will notice that those arrest warrants are for, uh, include warrants for the arrest of Benjamin Netanyahu and your Gallant, and you will know that amongst the many issues cited is starvation of civilians as a method of warfare uh, as a war crime contrary to Article 2B25 of the statute. I just want to check that despite what you have said about these statements, this would also be a factor that is weighed in Category B when you're making assessments about capacity intent to stick with yes. international I mean, the, humanitarian law. Uh, of course, but... Um, uh, the, you are referring to the statements I made in the House yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, the point I would make is this, that, of course, we are supporters of the ICC. Uh, we are signatories to the Rome uh, Statute. But that doesn't mean that we are devoid of an opinion. And the opinion of the British government is that uh, the ICC's actions, although they are at a very early stage and there's a lot more uh, to a lot more uh, water to flow under the bridge, that the ICC's actions are unhelpful if we are trying to get aid in, get the hostages out, get a sustainable ceasefire, and then move uh, on to the day after and a credible plan to resolve this long-standing issue which has poisoned the well of international opinion around the world. So you've, you've very patiently taken us through the judgments that you've made on uh, intent, uh, capacity and commitment to honour international humanitarian law in Israel. Um, and we've basically put to you four different pieces of evidence. Uh, the evidence that you yourself have given the House, that there is no credible plan to protect civilians. Uh, the evidence that you've given to the courts that says there has been um, an IHL breach. Uh, third, the conclusions reached by the United States that there had been an IHL breach. Uh, and fourth, the evidence cited in the ICC arrest warrants. 
You're inviting us to believe that when you put all four of those factors into an assessment, mm -hmm. the conclusion you still reach is that Israel has the intent and capacity to follow international humanitarian law and therefore arms export licenses are still okay. Uh, that is uh, precisely the right uh, conclusion, um, of course, but I want to emphasize that this is, a ro this is on a rolling basis. Uh, it's not a static process, um, and uh, we have an open mind about whether things could change, but you ask me for the judgment of the Foreign Secretary, and I've set out what that uh, judgment uh, is. But it, it may um, be helpful if I say that I've I appreciate very much that the committee um, is seeking additional uh, information. And it, it may be uh, helpful in view of the uh, strength of feeling and the level of interest in the IHL assessment process, which the committee has articulated this afternoon. Um, and as a result of that, I will look to see what more detail we might be able to offer in writing on the IHL assessments in relation to Israel-Gaza, both in terms of process and substance. And I will, um, I will come back to the committee and to Parliament uh, on that. But I, I just should emphasise no government has uh, sought to uh, reveal its legal advice. Uh, we are sticking to the precedents of past governments, including those of the government in which you were a distinguished cabinet member. Uh, and so we have no, uh, we do not believe it would be right to do that, but we will see, in view of what has been said this afternoon, we will see what additional information we can provide, and I will write to the committee about that. I'm grateful. And you, and you will understand that when the committee has before it evidence from yourself that there's no credible plan to protect civilians, the court submission that you made saying that there was an IHL breach um, by Israel, uh, evidence from the United States that says that there was an IHL breach uh, by Israel, uh, and the evidence provided in the ICC arrest warrants. Many of us will look at that evidence in the round and wonder how on earth someone can make a rational decision to keep arms export licenses open. But I'm grateful to you for the offer that you made, and I'm just <coughs> going to bring Mr Higginbottom. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to come back to the overall assessment that's made on uh, strategic licenses because I just want to try and understand where context for the conflict comes into it. So where in the assessment is the context of the 7th of October, the largest loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust, where is that factored in? Where is it factored in that just a month or so ago Israel suffered another significant attack from the state of Iran? Where is it factored in that Hamas continues to receive financial and military support from the Iranian state? Because I can't, from this diagram, see where all of that is factored in. Is it factored in in the ECJU? Is it factored in to the advice given to the Foreign Secretary? Is it factored in at the, the final stage when the Secretary of State for Business and Trade comes to make her decision? Or is it factored in peppered throughout all of that process? Well, um, you're identifying um, a number of uh, important and interesting political points. For example, uh, supposing we had decided uh, that it was necessary for an arms embargo to take place um, uh, about two and a half weeks ago when it was put to us in Parliament, the subsequent weekend saw a direct Iranian attack, not just by uh, drones but by cruise missiles on Israel and British military personnel were in action and British weapons were used to defend Israel. I think politically many people would think it was bizarre if we had imposed at that earlier stage an arms embargo, and yet we were using our own uh, resources and military assets to defend Israel. So I think that underlines the point that I'm making, which is we don't do these things as a uh, whim of politicians. We do it in a way set down and authorised by Act of Parliament, agreed by Parliament, uh, and it is in precisely the way I set out in my first answer. There is a process which takes place, a legal process, advice is given, uh, judgments are reached, and then uh, we, we, we account to Parliament on the basis that Mr Mack uh, set out uh, for, the, for the actions we have taken. So I appreciate the answer, Deputy. I'm still not entirely sure where context... Is it at kind of that A stage where it says the overall nature and dynamics of a conflict, that's the stage that 
context goes into it, or is it sits in as an umbrella over the whole thing? Well, the, the, the overall nature and the dynamics of the conflict are an appalling attack on Israel on October the 7th. The fact that under international law, Israel has the right of self-defense uh, for what happened, uh, but that that right of self-defense must be, must, must be uh, conducted in accordance with international humanitarian law. And that is the context, if I've understood your question correctly, that is the context in which we are exercising these judgments. Uh, Andy MacDonald. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just as a preliminary, uh, Deputy Foreign Secretary, are you accepting that that's an accurate um, representation of the process that's undergone? That, that, there's nothing there. That, we haven't put anything up there that's inaccurate. Well, I haven't, I haven't seen it before uh, today. Well, I've been staring which, at it which, for an hour. So. Which, it, yeah. <laughs> which, is why, which is why, being a rather cautious and well, would you tell us suspicious we... former whip, I, um, I read into the record my own, okay. as a chair, I noticed, I read into the record my own understanding, which is okay. pretty similar to that, yes. Okay. Well, if you could perhaps write to the committee and tell us whether we've got it right or not, that would be helpful. Um, of course. Yeah, just a return to this issue of the evidence and compliance, because um, the Foreign Secretary stated on the 12th of December 2003 that he was satisfied there was good evidence to support a judgment that Israel is committed to complying with international humanitarian law. Why did he feel unable to state clearly? that the evidence showed that Israel was committed to compliance, only that there was good evidence to support such a decision, because there's an important distinction. Well, um, just before I go precisely to that point, the, the, uh, I've given the context, the attack uh, at, at the hands of Hamas, Israel's right to self-defense yes. within human I've given that context, that very many civilians have been killed, Yes. and that we want to see Israel take greater care to limit its operations to military targets and avoid harming civilians and destroying their property. Yes. So um, my answer to Mr. MacDonald is that we continue to have grave concerns around yeah. humanitarian access, but we judge that Israel is committed to comply with international humanitarian law overall. So the, 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 the Foreign Secretary said there was good evidence to support that judgment. So did you believe, when confronted with the same evidence, that Israel was committed to complying with international humanitarian law? Yes, I agree with the Foreign Secretary. We see the same uh, material overall, and I agree with him. But there is a risk, is there not, that that may not be accurate, that there is a risk if we go back to... Um, Criterion 2, there's a clear risk that items might be used to commit or facilitate a serious violation of international humanitarian law. You ha he hasn't said categorically that uh, he is um, convinced that Israel uh, was committed to compliance, merely that there was good evidence to support that view. So that suggests that there's some a grey area between the positions. Isn't that one of risk? Well, it's important to recognise, as I said, that this is, I think the technical term is an iterative process, so that it's not, it's not set in aspic. It's, you know, we, we, it's a yes. rolling process. Yes. But it's important to be clear that the latest in assessment informed our decision that there is not a clear risk that items exported from the UK might be used to commit or facilitate a serious violation of international humanitarian law in the conflict. This leaves our position on export licenses unchanged. This is consistent with the advice that ministers have received. But as I said, naturally we keep well, that, the position under review. That is a remarkable position given what we just heard uh, the pronouncements from the ICC, the ICJ, and now the United States of America who have expressed themselves in the terms that the, the chair has described. Are, are, are we really saying that the, the UK government is content that there is a, no clear risk or no risk of Israel being in breach of IHL? 
Well, um, the British government uh, is appalled at what is happening. It's doing everything it can to alleviate suffering, spending an inordinate amount of time with our uh, very strong well, what uh, is foreign the British service government trying appalled? to look at the day after. But well, if you're, I, I'm, you're saying, asking, I'm talking about today. Hmm. Uh, so if, if the British government is appalled, what is it appalled about? Oh, we're appalled at the appalling attack that took place on October the 7th. We're appalled at the situation in Gaza. British ministers have set that out very clearly. But effectively, you're asking me the same question the chair asked, and my answer to you is precisely the same as my answer to him. Well, it's pretty incomprehensible, but uh, Mr. Mr. Mack, um, given that the only test is whether there's a clear risk of serious violations, why did the Secretary of State for Business and Trade make the decision not to suspend the licences? Well, as you rightly say, the, the test is very clear in the, in the criteria, in criterion 2C is whether there is a clear risk that items exported uh, from the UK might be used to commit or facilitate serious violations of IHL. She takes advice, as you've heard from the Deputy Foreign Secretary, from the Foreign Secretary, uh, who himself will have received information from uh, the Foreign Office and the process that you, you, you've referred to. So she um, has regard to those factors and has come to the conclusion that the threshold um, has not been met and therefore the position remains unchanged but as the Deputy Foreign Secretary rightly said we keep this review under uh, on a rolling basis we keep all licenses under review and it's not preserved in ASPIC and the process is continuous. I just want to check we've got this on the record it is your view Mr Mack that there is not a clear risk today of a violation of international humanitarian law through keeping open our arms export licences to Israel? Well, I'm not the ultimate decision maker, but what I am aware of is the criteria and the role of the Secretary of State for Business Trade as the decision maker. She has made that decision and she's made it for the, uh, based on the evidence she's received from the Sovereign Secretary. That is the methodical and rigorous process that we have okay. uh, as a government and it has been followed. It sounds like we need both the Foreign Secretary and the Secretary of State. Sorry, Mr McDonald, I interrupted you. <coughs> yeah. On that point, uh, Chair, I, I want to reiterate that the, the answers that the committee would receive would be the same as the answers today. Great. Well, we'd like the opportunity to... That's uh, obviating uh, find, the need find, to find uh, bother their eminences. Well, we, we didn't bother with anybody then, but just take anybody uh, along the line. Uh, Mr Lavery, did you want to come in? On just just the, uh, very, very briefly, in following on from um, Mr MacDonald, I'm just slightly concerned at the fact that the eminent lawyers which have been advising Kareem Khan, the ICC prosecutor, um, reached a conclusion that Israel were in breach of international law. Well, that's completely different to what the Home Office lawyers have said. The Home Office lawyers have said that they've come to the conclusion that the, um, Israel weren't in breach of any international law. I'm wondering why, why would there be such a difference? These lawyers advising Mr Khan You've got just Lord Justice Fulford, George Theodore Mirren, Baroness Kennedy, mm -hmm. Danny Friedman KC, Eliz KC, Elizabeth Willowst, Amal Clooney, among many, many other eminent lawyers. How are they incorrect? And the Home Office lawyers uh, seem to be... Uh, in the right place and it perhaps a couple of other very minor points can you confirm what type of legal training the Home Office lawyers have in this field and are they actually confident are they confident in sitting in the Home Office advising ministers that Israel isn't in breach of international humanitarian law. Well, I'm sure Mr Matt will want to answer this question, but can I, can, I, um, can I have a go? I mean, these are not Home Office lawyers, they are the government's lawyers and they deliver legal advice. Um, and uh, as I've repeatedly said, we never 
publish that advice, but we act within it and we act in accordance to it. But um, uh, presumably you, like me, Mr Lavery, are not a lawyer. And one of the things I would observe in answer to your question is that 600 lawyers uh, set out one position in the press uh, on one side of this argument. And uh, I certainly went to bed assuming that that was conclusive evidence. And a few days later, a thousand lawyers set out uh, the precise opposite. And that shows that it is possible to be a lawyer and reach a completely different conclusion to that reached by another lawyer. But equally, the importance of ministers having their own lawyers who give them uh, uh, expert legal advice uh, upon which they act and within which they remain. Well, I'll fully understand your reply, but how, how confident, Mr Mack, how confident, Mr Mitchell, are you that the, the government lawyers, not the Home Office lawyers, the government lawyers, are actually um, confident in themselves that they're given uh, the, the correct um, advice and that Israel isn't isn't in breach of international law because, listen, I know that we shouldn't re uh, believe everything we read in the press, but it's been widely reported that people within the Home Office, government advisers, are deeply, deeply unhappy that they're being asked to advise ministers that Israel is not in breach of international humanitarian law. Well, it, I mean, it may be um, that uh, Kate Joseph would want to say something on behalf of the civil service about that, because I understand that that is not precisely the uh, position. But if Mr Lavery is asking me my personal opinion as a minister about the government lawyers and the government legal service, I've, this is my third stint uh, in government so far, and uh, my experience of the government lawyers throughout that time has been absolutely first class. I'm going to move us on, if that's okay, because there's a vote imminent. I'm keen to get just a, I would, one or two more if, points if, on the record. If I may, Chair, mm -hmm. uh, can I address this to uh, the Deputy Foreign Secretary? Because Lord Cameron noted in his 15th of April 2024 letter to the Foreign Affairs Committee that he had reviewed the most recent advice about the situation in Gaza on the 8th of April 2024, which informed his decision not to recommend a change to licensing decisions. Can the Deputy Foreign Secretary tell us what was the time period covered by that advice? I think it was up to the end of January. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if I may, the, now the International Court of Justice Provisional Measures Order of the 26th of January 24 stated that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused to the rights found by the court to be plausible, namely the rights of Palestinians. How do you interpret this finding when considering potential clear risk of IHL violations by Israel in Gaza? Yes, this is the point about plausibility, I think, isn't it? Yes, yes. yes. The, the, there's been a lot of misunderstanding about what the ICJ decided in its ruling on the provisional measures, and this was helpfully clarified in an interview on the 25th of April by Joan Donoghue, the former president of the ICJ, who presided over the court that handed down the initial provisional measures order in South Africa's case against Israel. Um, and I think it's important I just repeat what she said, which is the court decided that the Palestinians had a plausible right to be protected from genocide and that South Africa had the right to present that claim in the court. It then looked at the facts as well, but it did not decide, and this is something where I, that is she, I'm correcting what's often said in the media. It didn't decide that the claim of genocide was plausible. It did emphasize in the yes. order that there was a risk of irreparable harm to the Palestinian right to be protected from genocide. But the shorthand that often appears, which is that there's a plausible case of genocide, is not what the court decided. It's useful to get that on the record. I'm going to suspend in a moment. Uh, on the current cycle for compliance assessment, I think you've got another compliance assessment due this week. Is that correct? I think it is imminent, yes. It is imminent. Thank you very much. Well, look, the committee is grateful to you all for your evidence. We're very disappointed that Parliament is not going to have the facts that are up to date that have been provided to court available to it at a debate that we have today, uh, uh, later on Thursday. Um, many of us will be fairly surprised at the judgments reached 
given the framework that you've set out, but the evidence that we've gone through today. But we're grateful to you both for the promise of answering some follow-up questions, which we're going to write to you after this committee with. And I'm very, very grateful to the Deputy Foreign Secretary for the offer to understand the process of IHL decisions a little bit better. And we look forward to seeing Mr Mack and the departmental colleagues tomorrow during our visit to the Export Control Unit. But for now, thank you. Sitting is suspended. Division in the House. Order, order. Are we coming back or not? We can all come back. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.